Hi there. This is another casting leak update for House of the Dragon. That a casting agency website now officially lists this new actress as playing Boros Baratheon's daughter. By which I mean, though, that it literally says, quote, Boros Baratheon's daughter, without listing a proper name even though his four daughters in the books do have names and they're all individual characters in their own right. So we need to unpack what's going on here. Because this does have implications for when is season one ending, what is season two going to cover. The big news right up front is this pretty much indicates that Boros Baratheon will be in season one. And I, for a long time, actually didn't think they were going to do that. In my last couple of videos, I said, I'm not sure if they're going to actually introduce the heads of the other great houses in Season 1, like Boros Baratheon, or Cregan Stark, Jane Aaron, Dalton Greyjoy. That was always kind of vague to us. And obviously, Jason and Tyland Lannister are in Season 1 because Tyland is on the Small Council, and of course he has a twin brother, so you'd introduce him. Th that There's reasons that's an exception, but this is important news in, in that if nothing else, it means Boros Baratheon will be in Season 1. He's probably already been cast, they just haven't announced it yet. But what is going on here with this specific phrasing, and how it relates to what is the end point for Season 1? Well, first, some background from the books. House Baratheon during the Dance of the Dragons consists of Lord Boros, his wife Alenda of House Karen, who is an important politician in her own right. House Karen are the lords of the Dornish Marches. And then their four daughters, who are so contentious they're called the Four Storms that starting with the eldest, the eldest daughter is Cassandra. Second oldest is Maris, who is said to be the least attractive but the most clever, so she has this acid tongue. And then the youngest two, they didn't tell us the order, but I'm assuming it's three and four. After Maris, you have Ellen, who is kind of a placeholder, she doesn't do much. And finally, Floris Baratheon, stated to be the prettiest one. Now, a TV show would almost certainly merge these into three, possibly just two daughters, that Ellen doesn't really do that much, that you could easily merge her with Floris. There is some question, you know, Martin was setting up the subsequent prequel eras when he was doing this. You set up young people and go, they were born then, and she'll do stuff when she's like 40 or 50, we're not sure. That, you know, Fire and Blood, which is part one, ends when Aegon III's regency ends. But he still rules for another 20 years, and going beyond that into the, the Dornish War eras and the Blackfire Rebellion eras, that presumably the other Baratheon girls will do stuff later on. That there's plot elements they set up in Fire and Blood for other shoes that are going to drop, other things that will happen later in Aegon III's reign because the last four dragons aren't dead yet at the end of Fire and Blood, and it just says within 20 years they died. So maybe Ellen does something later on in Martin's notes that we don't know about yet. But at this point in time, based on the print text, a TV show could merge out Ellen, and we wouldn't have a real reason to object to that based on what we know. What do these girls do in the Dance of the Dragons? They do a lot more during the Regency era as they become teenagers, but this would be like season seven-ish. But right at the beginning, they play a somewhat crucial role early on. That at the beginning of the war, Alicent and Rhaenyra's factions are trying to swing the great houses to one side or the other. That some of them are staunch loyalists. The High Towers and Lannisters are really behind Alicent. The Arons and Starks are really behind Rhaenyra. Some of them are a bit on the fence, and one of Alicent's major diplomatic victories was she swung the Baratheons to the green side, to her side, when everyone thought they were going to go over to Rhaenyra. But that, this is what happens in war, sometime, or, or a political election or something. 
they managed to swing people to their side through bribery and political favors. And as is so often the case in this game for a medieval society, they bribe them with political marriages. That Alicent isn't Circe, she's not an insane idiot, that it says she's closer to Elena Tyrell, she's actually a really good politician, and tactful. So, Alicent offers the Baratheons a political marriage that my second son, Amond, can marry one of your daughters. And they thought marrying into the royal house, even though it's the second son, okay, we will join your side. And then when Rhaenyra's son, Luke, comes, well, he goes, I'm already betrothed to one of my cousins. So the Baratheons go, well, okay, what have you done for me lately? They're offering me a political marriage and you're not. Then he leaves and Amon chases after him and they get into this brief, brutal dragon fight during a storm outside the castle. So the dance over Storm's End is the first dragon versus dragon fight of the war. And that's when things spiral out of control into total warfare, that before that, both sides were actually trying to win diplomatically, that they said if we can get enough great houses on our side, the other side will give up when they realize there's no hope of victory. But when you kill Rhaenyra's son, that means even if they're outnumbered, it's war to the knife. That when Alicent found out that Amon did this, she just said, from a point of practicality, how could you be this stupid? Rhaenyra will never just surrender now. They will fight to the death for this. And the Baratheon girls play a role in it, not just as prizes to be won, by the way, but as characters in their own right. That there's conflicting accounts in the historical records, but the one point they agree on is that of the four daughters, Amond passed over Maris, who is the least attractive but the smartest and cleverest. And wh whether he was debating to marry the oldest or the youngest and prettiest is unclear, but he skipped over the middle one. That when Luke came in open court and said, you have sworn oaths to Rhaenyra, and Boros said, well, are you offering me a political alliance or not? And he said, well, no, I'm betrothed to someone else. Amon, you know, made a move for him. Boros, you know, said, no, no, stand down and let Luke leave. But Maris felt so insulted that she had been slighted by Amon by him passing over her as, oh, she's too ugly to marry, that as Luke was walking out, she shouted out so loud everyone could hear, oh, what, Amon, you're just going to let Luke walk out of here? I knew you lost one of your eyes. I didn't know you lost one of your balls, too. And this enraged him so much that he chased after Luke with his dragon, and they fought and he killed him. So indirectly, Maris escalated the whole war like that. So, you know, these sisters have characterization. There's internal jockeying for position between all three of them. I should say all four of them. Again, I think you can merge Ellen with one of the other three. She's not really much of a character as far as we know. That's the background info from the books. With that context, what does this casting information tell us? Some have jumped to the conclusion that it means that the dance over Storm's End will definitely be the season one finale. I admit it could be, but my underlying point is we still don't know and it could go either way. In previous videos, I've discussed whether the Battle of Rook's Rest could be the end of season one. You know, when is season one going to end is a big question. And a big factor is they want a big action climax to season one when there really isn't in the story that the way it happens is it climaxes with Viserys' death, and then for a while there's a war of diplomacy before there's action. So will Viserys die by the end of season one? Alternatively, could Viserys die at the end of season two? I actually half hope, half think that's going to happen, and because the story skips a decade between Lenor's funeral, where Amond gets Vagar, the dragon, and the death of Viserys. And I said in other videos, maybe we should spend that decade, first, you know, six episodes of season two, rounding out. This is what the Starks are like in this prequel era. This is what the Greyjoys and Lannisters are doing in this prequel era. That's how I would do it. That doesn't necessarily mean it's what they're doing. But I said that from the casting information, we know Lenor's funeral is in episode 7. 
there is no way you could get to the Battle of Rook's Rest in only three episodes, because that would be an episode unto itself, and before that you need an episode with the Blood and Cheese assassinations, because it was in reaction to those, but that's an assassination, not an action scene. In turn, that was reacting to the battle at Storm's End, which in turn was reacting to Viserys' death. So you see, there's just too much to cram into only three episodes. I really doubt they could do that. So if they want to end on an action scene, Blood and Cheese is too far on and isn't action. Rook's Rest is a lot of action. It's way too far in the future that I'm saying at most, the most they could fit in, just physically into season one by the end, is maybe climax with the dance at Storm's End. Satisfies those requirements of being this action climax. Or they might end with Viserys dying. That, you know, I think there might be enough time in only three episodes to do, okay, time skip, uh, years have passed since episode 7, now it's episode 8. Here's Viserys dying. Then build up to that battle by episode 10. You might be able to do that if you cut a lot out. But it's plausible. Rook's Rest is implausible. And I'd prefer if they put that off until season 2. But we'll see what happens. What I'm saying is it's not confirmed one way or the other. Because it's curious the way they list her in this as just Boros Baratheon's daughter. You think about it. Mandy.com has been a reliable resource for us because they're a local casting agency in Cornwall, and they list off featured extras. These are people who even get dialogue. But if it was a really important speaking role, they wouldn't have publicly revealed it. Well, with this type of thing, sometimes we get rumors of uh, someone playing someone named Jane. And, you know, we can tell that's a code name for a really important character when it's something too generic. Versus when they call something Lannister Guard number two, it's probably just Lannister Guard number two. That's still useful because from these descriptions of featured extras, sometimes when, when they're descriptive enough, they say Grieving Merchant in Episode 7 or Corey's comrade in episode 7, oh, you mean like Carl Corey who kills Lainor? That we can glean story clues from very descriptive names for featured extras. This is weird because it's self defeating. That if you were going for a code name, you wouldn't have specifically said she's Boros Baratheon's daughter. Because, you know, he's a specific character and it's one of four of them. So it doesn't work as a code name nor is it so vague as to be meaningless. that This is a cross-purposes with itself. So just Occam's Razor, the most logical, pragmatic solution is, I think she's a placeholder for Baratheon daughters that will appear on screen in Season 1, but won't be developed as characters until Season 2. If they were going to have the confrontation at Storm's End between Amond and Luke, and Cassandra being there, and Maris yelling out, what, you lost one of your balls, too. They just call her Maris. They, or they would have announced it through HBO, because she's a, a relatively important speaking role. We wouldn't have found out about it indirectly, publicly, in just a list of, of featured extras, but bothering to say it's Boros Baratheon's daughter. This doesn't make sense. By comparison... Uh, they did this back on Game of Thrones, and you know, I actually think this was reasonable back at the time. You know, Martin was onto it. They actually paid a lot of attention to how they described Stannis and his family. That they said we really scrutinized the line where Melisandre says in season two, "Stannis has no sons." They said, "You know, we were really careful to tread around that because at the time, we didn't know how many seasons we'd get." And we officially didn't know if we'd later be able to introduce his daughter, Shireen. So they weighed their options on that, of just have some people dre dressed in outfits for this family, and maybe we'll clearly define them later. Or um, Cersei's children. I mean, they recast Tommen and Marcella later on, because they didn't know how much they'd feature them, and the kids they hired were extras. I mean featured extras, but they never thought they'd age into the roles. 
which I thought was annoying because I really like the original Marcella actress and she was actually really good. And I've seen her in other stuff, but point is, if you're not sure how many younger cousins or brothers you're going to introduce, have people there wearing generic outfits and later explain this is that other person. By which I mean what I'm leading up to is I think they're going to introduce Boros Baratheon in season one at like a tournament, one of the major tournaments. And that's great. I For a while I thought Boros wouldn't even be in it. And like sitting in the bleachers with him will be his wife and children. But for now, they didn't bother to delineate and specifically identify these are all of the daughters by name. Like, they'll have a group of girls sitting there, and like, maybe some of them are handmaids, because at this point in time, they don't know if they're going to have all four of his daughters, all four of the Storms, as distinct characters, or if some of them will have to be merged. So they're on the fence that, well, we don't know if we can have Floris as a distinct character from Cassandra, so let's just call her Boros Baratheon's daughter for now when she's being played by a featured extra. Then after the time skip, it minor time skips, we might recast the role for season two. That I think they're going to have glorified, the daughters will have glorified cameos in season one, knowing that they'll probably recast them by season two. I think that's the most logical explanation. The other issue, though, is this actress, uh, Emma O'Hara, it says that her playing age range, that it's re regardless of how old she actually is, it says age ranges I can play are 24 to 32. We knew we'd have to age some of them up, and I think that's closer in age to Ewan Mitchell, who we know is playing Amon like mid to late 20s. But if, if that makes sense, in the books, all four of the storms are maidens. They even say none of them have flowered yet. That, well, Cassandra will flower first, so she'll be the first to be able to give you children in a year or two. Now, it's more likely they aged her up because, you know, so she's roughly the same age as Amon. I, I can see that. But they're not teenagers. It's mid-20s. So how much of a time skip could there be? This isn't young Cassandra, like, alongside young Amon at the funeral scene. This will, she will be playing a Boros Baratheon daughter contemporary with Ewan Mitchell's Amon, which is a point back towards maybe they will show the dance at Storm's End. But it, to me, the, the weirdness that you're crediting her as Boros Baratheon's daughter, but not specifying which one when they're all distinct characters with their own personalities in the books or the outline. I think that's because they're vaguely setting them up the way they vaguely started setting up Shireen, or maybe there's another cousin or brother we didn't talk about yet from one of the other great houses we might want to introduce later, so that by season two they can recast or do whatever and specify this is Cassandra, this is Morris, and we don't have time to introduce the other ones. That the weirdness with the naming here leads me to think that we're we're not seeing Storm's End, the 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 dragon battle at Storm's End this year. Otherwise, they would have been more specific. I am excited that this really confirms Boros Baratheon is in season one. Maybe not that much, but he might be just at a tournament or something to to show him. But he will be there, and by extension. They're probably rounding out and just at least introducing with cameos heads from the other great houses that we have actresses who we suspect are playing Jane Aaron. I'm not really sure who might be playing Cregan Stark yet. I'd be surprised if they don't at least introduce young Cregan. Maybe not who's going to play him in season two. But like, you know, Council of Harrenhal have like a 10-year-old Cregan accompanying his father to Harrenhal for the council, just to establish the character exists, if not the actor who will play it for most of the show. It's nice news to have. I, I did not think we'd be getting news like this this early about Boros Baratheon, much less one of his daughters, though I don't think this is who's going to be playing the role as a speaking part in the points where, she act where the daughters actually do story elements in the narrative of the books. But I'm going to be making, I'm dashing this off as a quick reaction video, I'm going to be making longer, more structured analysis videos at higher quality where I was slowly re researching and writing out, this is what I think season two could be like. 
if they choose not to use Viserys' death as the end point for Season 1. These are the evidence we have from spy photos and from writing schedules and all that other stuff. I was already working on that. So please like and subscribe and, and stick around if you want to see that when I get finished.